Hey, what's up everybody at ThesU Conference? So good to be with you today. My name is Jake Sweetman and I serve as the lead pastor of a church in LA called C3 Los Angeles and also run a podcast called Vast.Faith. And uh, it's a joy to be with you today. I want to share with you out uh, of the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and also just a little bit out of uh, the book of Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 7, just this one verse Uh, The prophet says this, Up, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. And uh, we'll look a little bit about uh, how that applies to what we're looking at today uh, towards the end of the message. But first, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through to 16, uh, the great hall of faith. I'm sure you know it, uh, so I'll spare you the summary. But the scripture says this, These all died in faith not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, uh, that is Mesopotamia, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. I've entitled this little talk um, with a question. The question is, are you living out of context? Are you living out of context? I want to begin by uh, talking about how biblical faith uh, always has its context in the purposes of God. I think of the example of Abraham and how God called Abraham uh, outside of his tent and to look up to uh, the starry sky and to number the stars Uh, if he could, and this this is a vision that God was showing to Abraham to reveal to him the nation that was going to come through his lineage. God's talking to Abraham about the land that he's going to bring that nation into. He's going to bless them, multiply them, and he's going to use them to bring blessing uh, into the nations of the world. And the Bible says that Abraham responded to that vision that God had showed him with faith. That is, Abraham believed what God was telling him and then lived his life in accordance with that plan and in accordance with that promise. That is to say that Abraham's faith had a context. He didn't just pick up all of his belongings and and get his family to go with him and follow him out into a land where he had no claim or no ownership just because he felt like it. He did it because God called him to do it. And God's calling was the context for Abraham's faith. In fact, if you look at the story of all the people listed in Hebrews chapter 11, you'll find that their faith was always in response to God's calling. They understood their story as part of God's larger story. And this is the point that I want to make to us today because it applies deeply to us as 21st century Christians living in the West that biblical faith always has a context and that context is always the call of God which stems from the purposes of God. Now, context is defined as a set of circumstances that provide the setting for an event or provide the setting for an idea or a statement. And I just want to put before us today that the context that surrounds our lives, the context that surrounds the life of the church over the last 2,000 years is the most exceptional set of circumstances to ever take shape in any individual or any group of people's uh, experiences throughout the entirety of human history. And I think the briefest yet most thorough text that we can look at to understand that is the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. We see the context in which you and I are living today. Jesus says this in verses 18 to 20, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now that one sentence right there is incredible context for the life that you are living, that you are following and serving somebody who has all of the authority in heaven and on earth. He doesn't just have all of the authority in the realm that is often thought to be his, that is heaven. He also has all of the authority in the realm that is often mistaken to be Satan's realm or humanity's realm. But no, Jesus has all of the authority in the earth and also in heaven, in the seen and the unseen realm. The authority that we originally were given by God to have in the earth, to be fruitful, to multiply, to exercise dominion, we voluntarily gave that up to the powers of darkness. We subjected ourselves to their chains and to the chains of sin. But Jesus won that authority back through his death and through his resurrection. So now he has all of the authority in heaven and on earth 
the earth, which means for you and I personally that there's simply nowhere we can go, there's no battle that we can fight, there's no task that we might undertake where Jesus Christ, uh, where it falls outside the purview of his command. And I'm belaboring this basic point on purpose because I don't want the expansiveness of the context for your life to get lost on you. Jesus wanted his early disciples to know this, and he wants us to know today that the context for all of our living is that he has ultimate and complete authority. He is the one who has determined the direction and the conclusion of the human story, not Satan, not your sin, not your sickness, not your lack, not hardship, not your insecurity, but Jesus. And so we must live in that context of his authority. And we ask the question, okay, well, how do I live in the context? And Jesus answers the question for us in verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, so uh, I'm a pastor first and foremost. So this message is going to be very pastoral, and I am going to try to inspire you towards a life of purpose that is connected to what Jesus is doing in and through his church. And these two verses right here, this is more vital context for the way that you live. In other words, Jesus says, here's what I want you to do with my authority. And he's vested his authority into the church for three things here. Number one, to disciple the nations out of darkness into his marvelous light. Number two, to baptize them into the family of God. Number three, to mobilize them into the same mission. That's what he's given his authority to the church to do. And then he says, oh, and by the way, I'm going to be with you every single step of the way so that you can witness my divine power work through all of your human weakness. So Jesus set all of that, what we call the Great Commission, into motion 2,000 years ago as part of the redemptive story that he has written, and it is the only proper context for all of our faith and all of our lives. And this is what I want to say to you, that any other context for living can come only from somebody who did not have the authority to set the context in the first place, because Jesus has all of the authority. Living in this context is incredibly important because it what, it's what grounds your faith in an actual real story, in, in God's story. And without being grounded in God's story, God's purpose, what God is doing, oftentimes what might look like faith in the life of a believer is actually nothing more than just passion or enthusiasm and excitement. And there's nothing wrong with passion and excitement. But you can be excited about something without it being in its proper context. In the same way that somebody can be excited about sex outside of its biblical context of marriage, so you can be excited for life without ever even taking into account what God is doing and the story that God is telling and taking that into consideration for how and why you live. You see, I find a lot of times Christians want to have something in life that they are passionate about, and so they go looking for and pursuing and building whatever it is that they think this thing is going to be without thinking about how it ties into God's calling and purpose. And therefore, what they do never has the proper context. And so it either burns up in the process and never becomes anything, or it burns them up in the process because it lacked the proper guardrails to define and to focus what they were so passionate about in the first place. And the result of this can be everything from disheartening failure and feeling purposeless and meaningless, or it can be runaway trains that are intent on reaching their own destination without any concern for uh, what God's preferred destination would be. And I think putting our lives back in context of what God is doing in the earth is the fundamental key for so many Christians right now. And the outcome of that is that uh, your faith becomes something that is more than just uh, access into heaven. Your faith actually becomes something that informs all of your actions. And this is good because like Abraham, who responded in faith and that informed the way that he lived, so also you and I, in our response to what God has revealed through his son, what God has revealed through the scriptures, that's supposed to actually overflow in the way that we live. 
And I think a lot of times when we think about the way that we live as Christians, we reduce that down to just being really good at sin management, right? Like just batting away all of these various temptations to sin as though the Christian life were nothing more than an elaborate game of whack-a-mole. But I want to tell you today that God is inviting you to play an entirely different game altogether, one that enlists you as uh, a part among a whole in the advancing, ground-taking, life-changing purpose of God. And I don't care how mature you are as a Christian. I know I'm talking to people who subscribe to Theos U today. I know that all of us struggle with this idea of, well, when I get more qualified, well, then I'll join more in God's purpose. But friend, the only way you get more qualified is by joining in God's purpose in the first place. It's called sanctification. You say, well, when my life becomes more fruitful and when I get more of what I need or more resource or I get to a certain objective or a place in life, well, then I'll join in God's story. But the only way your life actually becomes truly fruitful is by joining God's story. It's called his grace working through your weakness. And to think otherwise about these things is to rip your life outside of its context and expect it to make sense and amount to its intended outcomes. We've all heard of... uh, the idea of people taking scripture out of context. Well, I think a lot of Christians are taking their life out of context. And they wonder why their fellow practitioners of the faith are looking at them funny sometimes as though they just quoted, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in regards to their Peloton workout. Like you would all think that is strange, but so many of us are doing that with our actual lives and we're living outside of the context. We're living outside of God's story and... We're not checking ourselves in how it is God wants us to think and how he wants us to view our lives, which ultimately boils down to the way that we actually live. And when you misunderstand the context in which you are living, ultimately what's going to happen is you will, you'll forfeit the contribution that you were meant to make to that context. When you get the story wrong, you get your own story wrong. And I think this is why we have uh, lots of Christians who are infirm in their identity, or they're, they're plagued by uh, disproportionate amounts of uh, anxiousness sometimes. And I'm not you know, belittling the um, notion of wrestling with anxiety. We all have that experience. But I think sometimes it's disproportionate and it's because we've forgotten the story. And so our thoughts don't have anywhere larger to land. And we're living out of context. And so our life feels ambiguous. And oftentimes we're... We're experiencing life not too differently than the way a non-believer experiences life because we forgot the story. So it's important that we get the story right. And we see a little bit of that story, obviously, in in the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Uh, But I want to see if we can just dive a little bit deeper into it because this doesn't affect just how we live. It also affects why we live. Uh, You've probably all heard the phrase uh, that uh, when we're speaking of the, the kingdom of God right now in between the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ, uh, that we refer to that time as the already and the not yet, or the now and the not yet of the kingdom of God. And this is in regards to the biblical teaching that through Christ's first coming, the kingdom of God was inaugurated in the earth. And at his second coming, the kingdom will arrive in its fullness and all evil will be destroyed forever. We, We know this, right? The incarnation was the arrival of God's kingdom by the death, the resurrection, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church. The kingdom of God is now present. It's reigning in our hearts. And when Christ returns, he will bring the fullness of the kingdom with him. Even to the point, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that you and I will exchange the frailty and the mortality of our bodies for a glorious resurrected body. And so what all of this means is that we can expect the kingdom to be already here in one sense while not yet here in another. In other words, the effects of Jesus' death and resurrection have not yet, by God's sovereign design, have not yet been applied to their fullest extent. You don't need to look very far to see examples of this. Satan is still allowed uh, to uh, to, to have certain activity Uh, in the earth. No matter what your eschatological views are, Satan is still out activity uh, in the earth. War still breaks out. We're seeing that right now uh, at this moment. Uh, Our flesh still wars with the desire of the Spirit in us. Sickness still disrupts our lives. Sin still trips us up. It's not hard to see examples of where the kingdom has not yet fully arrived, but it's also not hard to see if you're looking and paying attention and if if you're all in on the church which is 
the outpost of the kingdom of God in the earth and where you can expect to experience the most amount of the not yet being brought into the now, I would say, if you look there, you're going to see many instances where the kingdom is being manifested, where the victory of Jesus is being manifested over Satan and over sin and over sickness. And all of these demonstrations, from the most amazing demonstration of power to the smallest experience of mercy and grace, these are all manifestations of the kingdom of God. And they are the result of Jesus having the authority and that authority being brought to bear on the human experience. And I want to just begin to land this message. Um, and by land, I mean I have half a message left to preach. But the way Jesus does this is through his partnership with the church. Uh, this is part of the context for our faith, uh, is that Jesus brings the kingdom through his partnership with the church. There's a, a theologian named uh, Oscar Coleman, who was a Swiss man, and uh, he popularized the terminology of the already and the not yet, and he used a very helpful analogy to describe it. Pointing back to World War II, um, yeah, he, he would say that we were uh, in between D-Day and V-Day. And in World War II on D-Day, you have the Allied forces comprising of over 150,000 troops from the USA and Britain and Canada. They arrive on the shores of Normandy, France, and they're engaging in battle with Germany. And historians would say that D-Day, that day when they arrived on the shores, was the deciding moment in the war. It was the turning point in the war where uh, the Allied forces were going to win at that point. But it was nine months later when victory was actually solidified. So even though they look uh, and say this is the moment when the war was won, it wasn't until nine months later that the war was actually over in Germany surrendered to the Allied forces. And so Oscar Coleman uh, correlates this idea uh, to the kingdom of God, and he would say that we're living in that nine-month period between D-Day uh, and V-Day. Colossians 2.15, one of my favorite scriptures, says that God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him, that is, in Jesus. Jesus triumphed over the powers of darkness through the cross. That's D-Day. He's overcome the powers of darkness. He's opened the prison doors so that captives can go free. And now that the powers are defeated and humiliated, the day is coming, the Bible says, when they will be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 25 to 26. For he, Jesus, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That's V-Day. We're not there yet. We're living in the in between the two. Now the victory is guaranteed, but we're still finishing up the fight. And the way you and I fight is by announcing the news of Jesus' victory to anybody who will listen, to the whole world, and teaching them to follow him out of death and into resurrection. That's discipleship, by the way. Discipleship isn't something that begins after you get saved. You disciple people into Christ. And this is a challenge that I felt personally for me, just as a local church guy, a pastor here in Los Angeles, uh, in this post-Christian, post-modern, here was a new term that I heard today, renewed pagan time, is that uh, we still are called to disciple people into Christ. And our society is not so far gone that that is beyond us. If it wasn't beyond Paul, then it's not beyond us. And this is the mission that is meant to abound throughout the entirety of the church age, between Christ's inauguration of the kingdom and consummation of the kingdom. This is the context for all of our faith and all of our living. This is the larger story and the larger purpose which we're meant to be serving. So I just want to land the message um, for the second time with this question. What do you think about when you think about living for God? What do you think about when you think about walking with God? Because if what you think about is primarily a life of safety or a life of having arrived or a life of comfort or a life that is centered on your personal desires, and again, I know that I'm talking to mature Theos U subscribers who take their Bibles seriously and you're probably thinking, no, nah, that's not what I think about when I think about following God, but is it the way it actually bears out in your life? Because I still wrestle with desiring a life of comfort. I know for me, over the last couple of years, through 
all the craziness that we've been walking through, there's been this sense in me that's like, man, I just can't wait till like, I can eventually just chill out and embrace comfort to its fullest extent. And I got nothing wrong you know, with uh, experiencing comfort in life, but I do have an issue when that becomes our objective. And I do have an issue when we draw these imaginary finish lines in the sand where we say, well, when I get to this point, then I'll start living a little bit more uh, for myself and for my own comfort than I am for the mission of God. But I just want to remind you, and you know this, I know, that you were saved not just from something, you were also saved for something. And it is biblically correct to say that the armies of hell have been defeated, but they are not going to meet their end without throwing some tantrums that are aimed at keeping people from hearing the gospel. Revelation 12, 12 talks about uh, that exactly in relation to this, when Satan is cast out of heaven uh, through the death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, Apostle John says this, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, which is symbolic of those who are living in the domain of darkness, those who reject Christ. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. So the devil knows that his remaining time is short, and what does he do? He acts in vengeful wrath to try and undermine the plan of God, although he will ultimately fail. But the means that God has employed to triumph over Satan in all of his wrathful activity is you and I. It's the church living by faith in Christ. And that's what the pre preceding verse in Revelation 12, 11 talks about, that they, the church, they have conquered Satan by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives unto death. Now pay really special attention to how the Bible says we will conquer him. By faith in Christ, by loving our lives not unto death death. How do you love not your life even unto death? Well, I think it's by understanding the context in which you were meant to live in the first place. James Hamilton Jr. Um, in his book about biblical theology asked this very confronting question. He says, does your story enable you to look death in the face? Because that's the kind of story that you're meant to be living within. This, of course, is a sacrificial life. It's a generous life. It's a purposeful life. And the kind of life that is overflowing in these kinds of things only makes sense when you understand the true context for living in the first place. Terry Virgo, in his book, God's Lavish Grace, says this, that grace should never lead to passivity, but to outrageous adventure, a lifestyle that baffles those who play safe. It threatens the status quo, not only of tentative religion, but also of cynical unbelief. It sets the church free to risk all for the praise of him who freely gave all for us. And so Terry would say that the only way you can live this life is by the grace of God. And God's grace actually sets you free to live this way, to live the way that you deeply long to live. Before Christ, you and I, we were bound by fear, by worry, by anxiety. We were tempted and told to cling to all of our opportunities and all of our stuff and to our lives as a whole because those are all the things that we have. And Jesus did not save you just so you could do the Christian version of that and call it waiting for heaven. No, he sets you free from the bondage of fear to live in the might of his grace, which empowers you for a life of great impact. So when we think of walking with God, we should not think of something as primarily safe, and it should not bear out in our lives as a life of primarily oriented around safety and comfort. We should actually think of a life that is primarily oriented around adventurous. In other words, you're part of a local church. Your senior pastor gets up, casts vision. This is where we're going. This is what we're doing. We're going to take this territory. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you should respond in all of that. Yes. And that should run against the grain of your flesh, which longs for comfort and you should ignore that and push that aside and say what does faith want to do and what does living in the story tell me that I should do because I I believe that it tells you to choose adventure and as all good adventures go you never know what's around the next corner and what's around it might be dangerous but you turn the corner anyway otherwise what's the point in an adventure I'm kind of a nerd. I'm a little bit of a fan of uh, The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogies. Um, I was watching them the other day with uh, my son. He's seven. And I forgot kind of how violent they are. And we're watching Lord of the Rings. And then all of a sudden, an orc gets beheaded. And my seven-year-old son's like, did that, 
did they just cut that guy's head off? And I was like, no, absolutely not. You're seeing things. And like three seconds later, another orc gets even more clearly bad. He's like, dad, they did. They cut that guy's head off. Anyway, I like Lord of the Rings and I like The Hobbit. And as you're watching those two trilogies, not one time do you think to yourself when they come up against their next challenge, not one time do you think, man, I wish they'd just go home. You don't think that. You think, I want them to find the dragon and to slay it, to destroy every war orc, to destroy the, the wicked uh, wizard and to take the ring and throw it in the fires of Mordor and be rid of it forever. You want them to embrace the adventure. And that impulse, that desire is latent, not only in most humans, I would say it's latent in every single Christian. There's no, there's no use in you and I longing for a life of perpetual comfort or even eventual comfort. Because to do that is to take your life out of context. That's not the story you're living in. Our story is one where the best thing to do is to keep turning each corner in faith that God is going to use you to further advance his kingdom. It says in the Hebrews passage that we read at the start that these all died in faith. Man, that's a confronting statement. They died still having faith for a kingdom that they had not fully experienced yet. In fact, they had experienced a whole lot less than even you and I have experienced it today through the death and resurrection of Christ. And so they died in faith. The way that you die in faith is you never stop living in faith. They died knowing that their whole lives was a prophetic witness to the arrival of that kingdom. In fact, even as it stands right now, the, the passage that we read says that they uh, still desire the kingdom. If I'm remembering correctly, it's present tense, not past, not past tense. They still desire the kingdom. They are what Hebrews 12.1 calls the great cloud of witnesses who are cheering us on as we run our leg of the race. And they still desire for the kingdom of God to, to be brought through the church until one day Jesus brings it all home in its entirety. You see, God desires that you turn that corner that you've been fighting against. God desires that you turn that corner of walking more by faith than you have before, whether it's generosity or whether it's really adopting a true life of servanthood or whatever it is, that corner that, that God wants you to turn that you've been resisting, you should turn it because that's the life that you've actually been brought into through the power of the Holy Spirit. God has chosen to partner with his church for the demonstration and establishment of his kingdom so that more of the not yet comes into the now. A mentality of comfort seeks the most ideal present, and in so doing, it sacrifices the future. But adventure lives for the sake of a future reality, and in so doing, it brings more of the future into the present. And choosing between the two is always going to come down to understanding the context in which we are living. Now, let's just be a little bit sensible for a moment, because some of us need that. None of this negates you living a life of blessing. None of this negates you experiencing joy. In fact, I would say that when you really understand the context in which you're meant to live, it, it provides your blessing and joy, but it also informs your blessing and joy. You know why you have what you have so that you can use it for the purposes of God. And this, of course, in my experience, only causes God want to pour more into your life because he trusts you as a vessel to overflow instead of just a container to store. Many of the people listed in Hebrews 11, they did experience uh, what we would consider successful lives. Um, and yet they never counted any of it as having arrived because they knew there was something more. And when you know that there's something coming that transcends everything you have. You don't mind using everything you have in service of the thing that's coming. And this is just what I want to implore you, Theosu Conference, about today, is that you and I would truly live lives in context, not out of context, that we wouldn't just be Christian by name, but that we would be Christian by faith, and all biblical faith has its context in God's calling and God's purpose. What does this have to do with Zechariah. Let me just bring this home with Zechariah and then I'm all done. Zechariah was a contemporary of Haggai, uh, prophesying to Israel after their return home from Babylonian exile. Babylon comes in and they destroy the temple in Jerusalem. They exile a bunch of the Israelites. They're living in Babylon. They're there 70 years. They come home. 
And about 18 years after they returned home, and about 18 years probably after Zechariah himself returned home, he began to prophesy to them. And one of the things that he says is, uh, up, come out of Babylon, return to Zion. The reason he says that is because even though many of the Israelites had returned from Babylon uh, to Jerusalem, there were still a lot of them who were still living in Babylon. And so Zechariah is prophesying to the people of Israel, we're going to rebuild the temple, Jerusalem's going to flourish again. And the ultimate fulfillment of that, of course, is not in the rebuilt second temple, it was in the new creation. Uh, and so we are a part of the proper fulfillment of that prophecy. But uh, the reason Zechariah says that, that word about coming out of Babylon is because there was those people who were still stuck. In, they'd gotten comfortable living in a place that was infinitely lower than what God had intended for them, stuck in Babylon. And they probably were doing quite well there, increasing in wealth and marrying and having children and all these kinds of things. And yet Zechariah says there's a, there's a, you're living your life out of context. That's what he's doing. He's calling them to bring their lives back into context because that's not what God's doing. What God's doing right now is he's rebuilding Jerusalem. He's rebuilding the temple. What God's doing right now is he's building the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And funnily enough, of course, this is on purpose, uh, the Apostle John includes a similar exhortation to the church in the book of Revelation about uh, coming out of Babylon, not giving in to cultural compromise. And I know that there are all the obvious ways that people give in to cultural compromise, but you know that there are really subtle ways that we do it as well. And I think a lot of times it's wrapped up in pursuing comfort as the highest ideal. That's a mark of our age. Um, I think of the rise and triumph of the modern self, Carl Truman's book, and the therapeutic self, and how that is a mark of the 21st century in the West is we desire to be therapized and comforted and made to feel good. And that has crept into the church and it's crept into the psyche of the modern day Christian. And I want us to rage against that and to seek the life of adventure, to die in faith because we never stopped living in faith. Faith in God whose kingdom has come and is still coming into the world. The ASU Conference, God bless you. Hopefully this message was uh, encouraging, but also very challenging for you and helpful for you. Have a great day.